Since 2005, La Fuente Hollywood Treatment Center has been providing people with the tools they need to rebuild their lives free from addiction to drugs and alcohol. Hi, I'm Manny Rodriguez, Executive Director at La Fuente Hollywood Treatment Center. The questions I am asked over and over again by families, loved ones, and individuals concerned with addicts and alcoholics are, how can they be so selfish? Don't they care about me? Don't they care about themselves? Doesn't she care about her children? The list of questions regarding the alcoholic is endless. These are all legitimate questions. The disease of alcoholism is not understood by most people. Our goal at La Fuente Hollywood Treatment Center and for this video is to shed some light on the disease of alcoholism and addiction and how it relates to the people you love. In this video, I will walk you through the common questions and concerns along with some misunderstandings about alcoholism and addiction. At this time, I would like to invite my friend, Dr. Ryan Peterson, who is a board certified addiction medicine physician and a friend of La Fuente Hollywood Treatment Center. Dr. Peterson, one of the questions that I'm asked a lot is, is alcoholism a disease? Because to so many who don't understand alcoholism, they think, hey, it's a choice. What do you think? Manny, I'll give you this. It starts with a choice. It has been agreed upon by the greater medical community that alcoholism and, and, and addiction are diseases. Let's define what I mean by disease. Number one, it has a cause and an effect. Number two, it has a target organ, which is the brain. And number three, its symptoms are generally reproducible from one patient to the next. Meaning, what patient A has experienced in terms of symptoms, there's a high likelihood that patients B, C, and D, and anyone else with the diagnosis, has also experienced that. Things such as craving, loss of control, obsession, and perhaps most disturbingly, continued use despite adverse consequences. Let's take a moment and talk about the difference between a disease and a choice. I will do this by giving you an example of a choice. I walk into a department store and I see a really expensive suit that catches my eye. I look at the suit and I think with my brain in the past, the present, and the future. I think I remember having several suits like that. When I had suits like that, I got invited to parties. I even went on interviews. I'm sure I either sold them or they were left in an apartment that I fled or was evicted from. In the present, I'm upset that I no longer have suits like that. I long to be invited to parties and I quickly figure out how I can fake out the salesperson and leave the store with those suits. In the future, I look great in that suit. I may even get invited to parties. And you know what? Stealing that suit, not a major offense. Now, that's a choice. A bad choice? I am responsible for that choice. I am at fault for that choice. I made it with my upper brain that analyzes past, present, and future, and it was premeditated. If I get caught, a judge will punish me appropriately. As a result, the behavior changes. Choices, we are responsible for them. We are at fault. We made them with our upper decision-making brain. They are premeditated considering past, present, and future of the decision. A disease. We are not at fault or responsible for the disease in the inherited sense. Are you responsible for the color of your hair or your height or anything else? While we are able to analyze present, past, and future when making a choice, the disease of addiction and the part of the brain that is involved is only to analyze the current feeling in the next two to three minutes. Note. This is not to say that an addict is not responsible for the mess that they create. Diseases are faultless. Punishment, unfortunately, does not work to get you sober. The genetic nature of the disease cannot be denied. Let me tell you a little story about my family. My parents loved each other. They worked hard to give us more than they had and loved all 11 of their children. They were both from Puerto Rico and they never so much as even touched a drop of alcohol. 
out of the 11 of us children, three of us turned out to have a predisposition for alcoholism. Gratefully, I am in recovery since 1993. Unfortunately, my other two siblings' lives, they were cut short as a result of untreated alcoholism. Though neither of my parents ever touched alcohol, my mother's grandmother died of alcohol toxicity and several of her siblings struggled with substance abuse. My father, on the other hand, not one parent or sibling that suffered from alcoholism. It turns out that genetics represents about 60% of its development and environmental factors make up the other 40%. What does that mean? What I mean by environmental is that with a guy like me with a huge amount of genetics but being brought up in a Pentecostal household, I may have never ignited the disease in that environment as was the case for eight of my siblings. Likewise, someone who has a small amount of genetics could grow up in a neighborhood with liquor stores on every corner and certainly ignite the disease of alcoholism. Manny, I love your personalized example of the genetics of alcoholism. Mm -hmm. It's a great reminder that sometimes the genes activate and sometimes they don't. And the surroundings can really play the crucial role. Another great way to learn alcoholism is to look at another disease, the disease of diabetes. Diabetes is caused when insulin, which is produced by the islet cells of the pancreas, is not adequate or does not function well at its target site in the body. In general, the physical signs and symptoms of diabetes are reproducible in every patient that has it. Lack of insulin causes increased blood sugar, and the results of this are reproducible. They will want to urinate a lot. They will want to drink a lot of water. They may gain weight. They may lose weight. They may get neuropathy. But eventually, diabetes is more than an elevated blood sugar. It is a disease of small blood vessels, and those organs with the smallest blood vessels are affected the most. Like addiction, diabetes is a chronic, organic disease. It is lifelong. It is treated at best, but not curable. Sadly, both diseases are fatal if not kept in remission. But don't be disheartened if treated one day at a time. Using proper exercise, proper nutrition, and taking the prescribed medications, a diabetic can live with this disease, uncured, but treated, for 100 years. Similarly, as we see in 12-step meetings all over town, Alcoholics and addicts can live a completely normal, and I would argue happier and more fulfilled, life for decades with this disease in remission. Sobriety lasts for decades, but interestingly it is granted in 24-hour increments. We stay sober one day at a time. The hardest part is getting sober. We need a lot of help for that, and it can't be done alone. Thanks, Dr. Peterson. I have always loved that comparison. Earlier you mentioned that the brain is the target organ of the disease of addiction. Is it the entire brain or a piece of the brain? No, not the entire brain. Addiction is primarily associated with the reward center, also known as the limbic system or the reptile brain. This structure is located in the midbrain, the part of our brain responsible for automatic function. And any addict will tell you how automatic his drug or alcohol use feels. The disease of addiction has a target organ called the midbrain, and this is the section of the human brain which is extremely primitive. It developed millions of years before the upper brain, which is the brain area that makes us unique as humans. Certain animals, such as reptiles, only have the lower brain. But man, as he evolved, got an upper portion of his brain designed to do very important things such as executive function, complex decision making, planning, and thought. The reward center uses a neurotransmitter which is a chemical that creates messages between nerves called dopamine. Much like insulin and diabetes, it is with dopamine that we find the dysfunction inherent in this disease. Once that switch has been thrown and casual drug and alcohol use has ended and addiction and alcoholism has begun, our body simply wants more dopamine. We become obsessed with the rewarding feeling that dopamine produces and we will throw anything away in our lives in order to experience even a small amount of dopamine produced by drugs and alcohol it hijacks our entire brain. Essentially, the reward center takes over the whole brain and as the disease develops in that one in 10 people in our population who have the genetics for addiction.
Now let me share with you some of the symptoms of addiction and alcoholism. Number one, loss of control. Number two, craving and obsession. Number three, continued use despite adverse consequences. And I would even add to this list, denial. Denial is so inherent to the very definition of addiction to me. As an addict, I am unable to see myself honestly. The beauty of having counselors and peers in the recovery community, such as what La Fuente provides, is that we can see each other much more honestly than our denial allows us to see ourselves. And that can be life-saving. Manny, you're out there in the trenches treating this disease. Tell me how you see this disease affecting people. What does alcoholism and addiction do to people? The four critical areas of addiction that we address at La Fuente Hollywood Treatment Center are biological, psychological, sociological, and spiritual. Probably the most important, but also the most elusive. Let's start with biological. The human body is a very resilient organism, and because of this, it is the last area where problems are seen. Regardless, problems do arise. Abscesses can develop from intravenous use of drugs such as heroin. Teeth can fall out from meth use. We also see cirrhosis of the liver and neuropathy from long-term alcohol dependence. Patients bounce back the quickest from the biological problems. In fact, it's the area last affected and the first area to come back. That's why people after being in treatment for only three to four weeks suddenly think, I'm cured. They feel better physically because their withdrawal and craving symptoms have been mitigated. They're sleeping and eating like normal people. But this is just the beginning. It's a false sense of recovery and it comes over almost everyone. Feeling physically better is great, but that does not mean they have developed, developed the ability to manage their disease. Their psychologic and social conditions must be considered and a commitment one day at a time to treat these areas must be made. Now about the psychological area of the addiction. Patients after long-term use will have developed depression, anxiety, they become suicidal and they cannot manage their compulsivity or regulate emotion. Now about the social aspect. This is the area where the person suffering from the disease gets into the pattern of not showing up for family matters, gets in trouble with the law, DUI, begins having strained relations with friends and partners, can't show up for work, and as a result, has no money and is in a financial crisis. Now let's talk about the spiritual component, an ever elusive idea. Spirituality has been defined, written about, and advocated by so many committed to making a difference in the world. For the sake of this conversation, let's view spirituality as having everything to do with how we conduct ourselves in our lives. Individuals in early remission from the disease of alcoholism or addiction have very little coping skills. While in their disease, they have also suffered from arrested development. Their lives up until this point have been hijacked by their reptilian brain. Utilizing the upper brain to work through problems, fulfill simple tasks, develop and form relationships has to catch up in most cases. How we conduct ourselves in the world has to be relearned. The alcoholic is not the only one to be affected biologically, psychologically, sociologically, and spiritually by his or her disease. The family as well has been severely affected. For example, a mother who has spent her life worried sick about her loved one will eventually develop physical consequences of chronic stress, hypertension, immune problems, and even cancer. The father is plagued with anxiety and worry about the financial condition of the family he requires anxiety pills and antidepressants because of it, psychologic. The sister's own relations suffer because she is afraid to invite any of her friends over to their home, which has become unsafe and unpredictable, social. The family under these stresses has learned to live in dysfunction and unable to spiritually develop and form relations that seem normal in other families, spiritual. The disease of addiction is a family disease. 
And that is why at La Fuente Hollywood Treatment Center, we have a family program. What about relapse? We do everything we can to prevent relapse. However, no disease is treated perfectly. Relapses can be very powerful lessons. Relapse, it's built into the very definition of addiction. But don't forget, relapse is also built into the very definition of chronic disease. All chronic diseases have ups and downs. Does anyone blame with anger and disgust the multiple sclerosis who, after getting out of a wheelchair and having a productive life, succumbs to a relapse? No, we would not. Again, we do everything we can to prevent relapse, and we must treat everyone with compassion and understanding. Finally, I want to have Dr. Peterson share a few words about cross addiction. As we learned earlier, addiction and alcoholism is a disease of the reward center in the brain. All drugs of abuse have one thing in common, which is that release of dopamine in the reward center. It doesn't matter what your drug of choice is, whether it's uppers or downers or pain pills or booze, the one thing that all these substances have in common is this firing of dopamine. So once that switch has been turned on and the person has become addicted, they will also be susceptible to any substance that releases dopamine, even after years of abstinence. The reward system does not differentiate between one drug or another. La Fuente Hollywood Treatment Center is committed to treating every patient and their families with compassion, respect, and understanding. This disease can be overcome and big, bright futures are possible for all. I want to personally thank Dr. Ryan Peterson for his contributions and sharing his expertise on this subject. His continued support and the sharing of his own journey are truly appreciated. La Fuente's goal is to make treatment accessible to anyone in need. Thank you. La Fuente Hollywood Treatment Center, real recovery in the real world.